What is up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Admit One, your movie ticket. I am, of course, your host, Jim. Today, we're going to be diving into the Fantastic Four. So the Fantastic Four movies I'm going to be talking about are the 2005 version, the 2007, and the 2015 one. Uh, I don't have access to the Roger Corman version, so we won't be talking about that one. And I honestly could give two shits about this team. It wasn't part of my growing up at all. I'm not familiar with the characters other than the movies, so... I really don't know much about them, so excuse me if I get some of their lore wrong and and backstories and things like that. I originally saw the 2005 version on a whim. I was out with a couple of friends and we had nothing else to do. We are kind of like, well, the theater's right here. Why don't we just go see what's playing? Uh, Fantastic Four happened to be the only thing playing at that time frame, so that's what we saw. Of course, this isn't the first Fantastic Four released. Roger Corman made an unreleased version uh, to keep the rights to the movie, basically. And what what they call an ash can copy. So they make it not intending to release it at all. Um, and it was actually made in 1994, which I had no idea it was that recent. I thought it was more uh, 80s. But um, if anybody's got a copy out there, let me know. I'd love to watch it. And of course, it was a long road to the screen after that. What is that, uh, 11 years? And let me just say this. I like these movies. They're not good um, by the normal standards, if you will. They're never going to win any Oscars. They're never going to be up there with The Dark Knight or Spider-Man 2 or anything like that. But they are fun to watch. And it's one of those movies where you need to know and understand what you're watching. If you're going in thinking you're going to be blown away by this, you're not going to have a good time. So one of the things that I like that this movie did best was the concept of the heroes coming to terms with their powers. And it's almost like a, a handicap allegory, if you will. These people have these powers that they have no idea how to control, and here is a whole movie of them trying to figure it out. And the concept of heroes coming to terms with their powers, um, it's almost like a handicap allegory, if you will. Um, these people who have these powers, who they have no idea uh, how to use them, what's going on, how it's affecting their body, things like that, getting used to normal life with these powers. But it doesn't quite handle them properly. You can't deal with these concepts when you play fast and loose with seriousness. You know what I mean? Maybe these concepts weren't perfect for this movie. At least this version of it. These characters, sure, make another movie with uh, those concepts in it, and it'll work perfectly. But just not this one, where it was more, I'm going to say family-oriented, but that's using it in a derogatory term, and that's not what I mean. It, a movie that maybe took itself a little more seriously. It also sets up this cool, another cool concept of heroes dealing with fame, but it mishandles that as well slightly. Like I said, you can't throw in a bunch of these heady concepts in a movie like this. The movie kind of works against itself uh, with names like Von Doom and, and Fantastic Four. It worked in the comics because they were established in a time when that was commonplace, so obvious names like that, uh, words like calling people the Fantastic Four, things like that. With this movie, you're establishing something new. So why not throw in new ways to introduce those characters and names and things like that instead of relying on the tropes set up by the comic books. But, and I'll mention it a little later too, these movies 
do at least these first two have a clever way of naming people. In this one, they just straight up ask him, what are your superhero names? And this movie is cheese on all levels. It feels like it was written with the 90s in mind. Victor's place is very 90s. It's dark. It's made basically of bricks. And it's lit only by a fireplace. It looks like something you might watch on Silk Stockings, which was a, a 90s program on USA, which was like a, a primetime soap opera. When he's in the board, when Victor's in the boardroom for his company, like the boardroom chairs are high backed and they're black and made out of leather. Like it just screams and oozes villainy on, on these guys' parts. But it does have a cool old school villain in the shadows reveal, so it kind of steps out. That was a nice touch. But what I do want to know about Von Doom is. Why did the people of Latvia give him an ominous mask? Does it mean something? Like, he never explains really what it means. The meaning behind the mask and also what it means to him. What attachment does he have to that mask? We see it once before he puts it on, but what does it mean to him? It might give us a little more backstory. For people familiar with the comics may know that, but someone coming in to the movie for this first time uh, you know, for me, watching it again after all these years, I have no clue. I still don't. I didn't research it at all. I don't know what his uh, attachment is to that mask or what their motivations were for giving it to him. Nor did I understand why he's hating on the Fantastic Four. If you're familiar with these movies, let me know. Maybe I missed something. Uh, it just seems like he is being the bad guy for bad guy's sakes. Like, it's there's no motivation there. What is his motivation? Because they're clearly the good guys? Because there's more of them on one team than on his team? I really don't know. What I also don't know is, were Jessica Alba's motions when she's using her powers an artistic choice? Did her and the director sit down and say, this is what it's going to look like? Or was it an on-the-cuff kind of thing? Or the director was telling her, please don't do that, and she was kind of big at the time, so he gets shut down? I don't know. But they're terrible. Jessica Alba in this is awful anyway, more so when she's using her powers, but in general, she is the worst part of these movies. If they had found someone else for her part, it probably would have been a more watchable movie. So moving on to Ben Grimm and The Thing, he's one really that has to deal with his powers more than anyone else because he doesn't look normal, if you will, uh... And again, that goes back to the concept of these heroes dealing with a handicap. And that might be an allegory for, let's say, being gay. He doesn't know how to fit in with this world. People look at him weird. That could have been an excellent story arc for him. And I don't mean that as gay being a handicap. I was just using that as, a, as another allegory. But how does he, I, I know that he knows that he can jump out of a wall when he turns into the thing. But how does he know that he can stop that truck on the bridge? Was that just him being a selfless hero? Again, it's not really clear in this one. And even though he does look a little funky sometimes, I do appreciate the practical thing costume. It really worked for what this movie was. But his wife was kind of heartless. When he's talking to her on the phone... She runs outside in the middle of New York in a nighty, not even wearing shoes or anything. I don't even walk around the house usually without shoes on. I'm definitely not going to run around the streets in New York shoeless. But I think she kind of sees him that night. Uh, even though he's wearing that trench coat and the hat, like you could probably tell that something's off. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that she's heartless because after the fire truck on the bridge incident, like she clearly sees that he's still a good guy. But she just throws the ring back at him without even talking to him, you know. I get that she's a little apprehensive now that her husband's a giant rock monster, but be a human. Have some heart. Talk it out. And if you still feel that way, then it is what it is. I can't blame you, but she's kind of heartless. Another shining moment of this movie is, of course, Chris Evans. He's one of the few actors that I can actually recall seeing his first movie, not another teen movie, and following his career. Uh, maybe because I was around that age where you can start forming those memories like that. 
So it's kind of cool to kind of to see him start off in a movie that today I really wouldn't even watch and grow into this actor that I can probably guarantee you he'll win an Oscar one day cuz he is just on another level in this one. I wish he would do kind of more dark comedy sometimes, but I appreciate all the roles that he does, but this movie kind of will give you an idea of what he's really capable of uh, comedy-wise if you didn't already think so. This movie also doesn't waste any time getting to the actual event of them turning into the heroes. It spends most of the time on them figuring things out, which includes Doom, which is neat. A lot of times superhero movies will focus solely on the hero itself, which is fine. You know, like uh, Christopher Nolan's Batman uh, trilogy, the villains are all absolute, meaning they just are. They don't need a backstory. You know they're bad guys. With the exception of Bane, they kind of give a little bit of a backstory on him, but not much other than how he turned into Bane. That's it. So this movie giving equal screen time to everybody developing their powers is something unique almost in the superhero movies. I do remember, I never owned this movie on DVD, but I did go and buy uh, what's called a UMD for the PSP, which was like Sony's first handheld video game system, if you remember that. And their whole spiel or marketing plan or whatever was that um, you could watch movies on it, which to me is great. Growing up, I, I really wish we had some sort of... If I was born a little later... It would have been perfect because obviously I love watching movies. When we went on trips, which we did a lot, I had to uh, find other ways to occupy myself, whether it was reading or listening to music all the time. I had always wished that there was some sort of portable movie playing system I could have used. Sony's uh, PSP was the first thing I really had. I didn't really use it, really, to be honest with you. Maybe watched a few movies in the parking lot, but that was their whole platform on it. Um, I did buy it. It was like a little disc in a cartridge. I did buy it then. And what's interesting is this is one of those movies, like Transformers 2, uh, where the DVD was actually altered for release. And I don't mean like, well, I guess I do kind of mean like George Lucas is a big offender of that, where uh, any, you know how he constantly tinkers with the Star Wars movies. Even from the release in the theater to DVD, there's tinkering going on. And I don't on this one, I don't understand why. There's a scene towards the end of the movie where Jessica Alba, Alba and Yon Griffith are talking kind of about their relationship, I guess. In the theatrical version, they're standing in front of the Statue of Liberty, where in the DVD version, they're actually in a planetarium, which is weird because it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's not aesthetically distracting to the eye or anything like that. I get some tinkering, but that part just doesn't make sense to me. Another difference is there are no beep sounds when Dr. Doom fires his heat-seeking missile, which is probably a good idea. Probably, I don't remember seeing... I remember seeing it in theater, but I don't remember a lot of things from it. That makes it sound kind of comical right there. And there's a few other uh, differences as well. But And th there's actually uh, an R-rated version on DVD. So if anyone's seen that, reach out to me. Let me know what's different than that. I wasn't able to get a copy for that, but I want to know, is it like the Daredevil R-rated version where it supposedly makes it a better movie? I don't know. I'd love to hear some comments on that if you've seen it or have it or whatever. So after the surprise success of the first one, the second one was Fast Track to Production, um, released two years later. And it doesn't slip in terms of quality because, like I said before, they're not quote-unquote good movies. They're fun to watch, like I said, but they're not going to win any Oscars. And I was pleasantly surprised by the first one, obviously, so naturally I'm looking forward to this one. And I was fortunate enough to see this one in the theater as well. I believe my uncle was in town. He took us, took me and my brother and his family out and, and saw it. And it definitely follows the sequel adage of making it bigger and darker. And it's always stood out to me how short this movie is. I think it's like an hour and 20 minutes long. And it crams a lot of stuff in there. It never feels short, even though the runtime is a third of what a Lord of the Rings movie is. But this one was shot more modern looking, so it kind of got rid of, of, rid of that 90s aesthetic. 
Uh, although at one point Johnny does wear a zoot suit, so I'm not sure what the filmmakers were thinking there. The cheese is dialed down a little bit, but not too much. Like I said, Johnny wears a zoot suit, and it continues the theme of heroes dealing with fame, but it kicks it up a notch. Now Johnny is wearing product endorsements on his super suit. Again, some cool concepts, not really dealt with properly. In this one, they kind of, they, they're trying to deal with uh, being superheroes, and do they really want to be superheroes? At the time, I found it kind of lame and tiresome. Maybe it was because Spider-Man 2 had just came out a couple years before. And the concept has since grown on me. I'm glad it didn't catch on, but that's not really what I want to see in a superhero movie. Struggling with it, sure. Being selfless is also cool, but not wanting to be it is not something I really want to see in a costume superhero. The first one was very personal in terms of goals. So they're, they're just trying to figure themselves out. They're just trying to find a cure for themselves. This one takes it away from them. Now it's in someone else's hands. It's the end of the world. They're trying to stop Galactus from eating the world. And because of that, this one becomes darker in tone. They're dealing with the end of the world. And even though they're, they're, they're trying to stop Galactus, you never really see them fighting crime or stopping crime. Even though Sue kind of makes an offhanded comment about it, I thought that was kind of interesting. Usually with superhero movies, they're at least stopping some petty crime, even if it's related to the larger story or, or whatever or not. I just thought that was kind of interesting. You insert some little scene. You're only at an hour and 20 minutes. Just put in a 10-minute little, you're stopping a bank robbery thing right there. I don't know. And say what you will about these movies, but you can't deny that the four main leads have chemistry. Maybe not Jessica Alba, but the other three definitely do, especially... Johnny and Ben. And I really like Michael Chiklis as the thing. In both of these movies, really. He does a lot with that character, and especially with that uh, uh, practical makeup on him. However, I am not a fan of Stan Lee cameos. I'm sorry. You can hate me all you want for saying that, but the, it's one of the things I look forward to the least in Marvel movies. But this one is pretty clever because he plays himself in it. Again, there's a somewhat clever way of naming heroes and, and villains. Just state the obvious. Oh, he's silver and he's riding what looks like a surfboard? Let's call him the Silver Surfer. Your name is Victor Von Doom and you're a doctor. You're now Dr. Doom. You can stretch? Congratulations. You're Mr. Stretch. That's not his name, but you know what I mean. But Dr. Doom's costume is a vast improvement in this one. It's more menacing for sure. But how did he lose those skin grafts and keep the electricity? You almost get like you're, you're, you get to keep the cake and eat it too. I liked it better when he was fully affected and permanently affected by the storm. I get that the Silver Surfer erases people of their powers and makes them uh, transfer powers to each other. But if you're going to do that, strip him of his power or make it worse for him. That would have been cool. By doing that, you make him more powerful, but then you make it makes sense when he becomes the bad guy again. And the movie definitely shits the bed or jumps the shark or whatever you want to do it when it full-on pulls a Batman and Robin with that flying supercar sponsored by Dodge. But it does have a Hemi in it, I guess. Maybe that's its saving grace. That's where the movie kind of loses it for me, is when they do that. Luckily, it's not in it very long, but... A flying car, I get, but... Not this thing that clearly looks like it was made to sell toys. And take note, Green Lantern, or they should have taken note, rather. This is how you portray a planet-eating fart cloud. Not that weird yellow-green alien thing. Again, back to taking the sequel up a notch. The final climax in this one is a little more serious and more heart-wrenching, I guess, than the first one's uh, street corner battle. There's lives at stake here people do die. And just like Captain America, this is a sequel I'd make. The villains from the first one that didn't die are back again. They're dealing with a continuing story kind of uh, concepts and things like that are followed through with. Maybe it's a Chris Evans thing. I don't know. And, and another sequel is actually planned, but it was obviously scrapped and rebooted for 2015's Fantastic Four. Or Fan Four Stick as the marketing led you to believe 
So the reboot was only announced two years after Silver Surfer, which I may have missed that news back then. But it took a while for it to get to the screen anyway. And this movie famously had some issues, if you will. There was clashes between Josh Trank and the studio, and Fox ordered reshoots in early 2015. And let me say this about reshoots, and we'll kind of talk about it a little bit, but just because a movie has reshoots doesn't mean there's a problem with the movie. A lot of times you shoot everything and you realize you get back to uh, the editing studio and um, things don't work. I had this happen a lot when I was making movies. Something doesn't make sense or uh, you could use a little pickup shot here of someone saying this and it makes those two scenes better relate. A lot of times movies are better for it. So keep that in mind when you hear about these negative stories about reshoots. It's not always a bad thing. But this thing was plagued with rumors from the start. And that's really the problem with internet movie culture today. Whether it's true or not, the negative reaction to this thing, to, to this thing people hadn't seen, affected this movie in a big way. Um, no one showed up for it. It tanked big time. I liked it. I didn't see it in the theater, but I bought it on Blu-ray as a blind buy. I liked it a lot. Maybe it's because um, I had low expectation for it. I, I'm, I really don't know on this one. But it's one of those movies where I would have written a uh, a defensive article, I guess, which some people hate, but it is what it is. I, I don't think this movie deserves the hate that it gets. And remember, too, just a studio, it's it's a business, you know what I mean? If they don't like what they're seeing, they have every right to change it, whether we as the audience and fans like it or not it's their product and remember too a studio can cut a flick and it can still be good new line took american history x away from tony k and look how good that movie is it's not even a finished movie and look how good it is so just when you hear stories like this keep an open mind for the movie itself and remember the people involved in this no one sets out to make a bad movie if you're due you're in it for the wrong reasons a lot of times something can sound great on paper and it just doesn't translate well to the screen. Things happen. You know, it's not the studio's fault necessarily. It's not the f filmmaker's fault necessarily. Will we see a trend cut of this movie? Probably not, but I would love to. I know he said that there's a better cut of it out there. Uh, the actors have said there's a better cut of it out there. I would love to f uh, for Fox to let him finish that once that scar has healed over. We got four versions of Alexander. Why can't we have another one of Fantastic Four? So moving on to the movie itself. Some idiots, when casting was announced, had a big problem with Johnny Storm being black. Let me just say this. If you had that problem, turn this podcast off right now. I don't want you listening to it. To me, it doesn't matter uh, what color the heroes are. I think the hero needs to be the hero. And what I mean by that is Bruce Wayne should always be Batman we've whether he's black or asian or or whatever he should always be bruce wayne though other people have taken up the mantle like dick grayson or jean paul valley but traditionally it should always be the person now when you get into instances like spider-man where you have different spider-men that's cool make them whatever but again peter parker should always be quote-unquote spider-man whether he's black or gay or Asian or handicapped or whatever. While the original waste, or I guess the original two, waste no time getting to the actual accident, this one takes its time getting there and it's better for it. There's more character development between the, um, the leads. For instance, I like the backstory of Ben and Reed, how they were uh, friends from different sides of the track, I guess is the term. But he does kind of forget him when he goes into research mode, which I kind of thought was a dick move. They only call him when they needed his help or whatever. Like, he didn't he didn't stay in contact with him. And if the timeline is to be understood, they are only in 11th grade when they go to the Baxter building to begin that research. And I don't buy them being so young. Spider-Man, I get him being in high school. I still don't like it. To me, like, I was an idiot when I was in high school. There is no way that I'm going to make uh, 
life-changing decisions or being of the right headspace to battle the bad guy or or save these innocent people over here. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Are some people sure, but all these all these kids, I I really don't think so. There's a reason why we don't let people drive until they're 16 and vote till they're 18 and drink till they're 21. Same should be for superheroes. You're not allowed to put on a costume until you're uh, 25, maybe, let's say. And their age, I think, directly relates to their stupid decision to get in the machine and ruin everybody's lives. I had said before that the Fantastic Four and the way that they name these characters is is silly because when they were thought up, they were a product of their time. And that goes for the catchphrases as well. And this one, Flame On, is really the only one that translates to present time, at least in the way he he uses it. And some people took issue with the it's clobbering time history because his brother used to say it before he beat him up. I don't, other than it is silly to yell before you beat someone up in a movie this serious. I said before that the other one didn't take itself seriously enough. This one is the 100% opposite of that. But he does use it later when he fights Doom, so he kind of used, parlayed that into, my brother was a bully, you're a bully, and I'm going to gonna throw it back on you. Kind of like when Captain is fighting Iron Man at the end of Civil War. You know, he says that, I could do this all day. It's kind of like a little throwback. And this movie is not without its cheese ball lines. Like when Reed is addressing Doom in the finale. And that headbutt that the thing gives to Reed is one of the most silly things I've ever seen. I laughed out loud when I saw that. Like it, it blew me away that that was so bad. And the thing, not wearing pants. Let me address that real quick. He's a fucking rock. Uh, and he looks like a rock monster in this. He's not uh, some humanoid shaped smooth rock creature like he was in the first two he's an actual rock monster if he was wearing pants he would look stupid sometimes i think you got to look objectively at things not just because of what he traditionally wears and there's only one true action scene in this movie and maybe that's why people didn't take to this the most there are some other issues for sure, but maybe that's why. It is It is a little slow. It's more of a thinker than an action movie. And and it goes against that action and superhero movie archetype that, you know, there's a beginning, action, a middle, and an end. This one only really has the end, and it's not very long, so maybe that's where people had the issue, or their biggest issue, rather. But I like how they handle all their powers differently. Like I said, it's more of a thinker, so it's focusing more on the character's and kind of their quote-unquote handicaps with these powers some embrace it and some don't just like in real life some people have trouble dealing with their handicaps and some can fully embrace it it's a perfectly normal human response in my opinion a big upgrade though is sue storm's use of her powers it looks like someone who actually had teleconnect powers would actually act and it also attempts to explain how their powers are different which was kind of cool in the first one, obviously, they're aboard that space station, and they all get zapped with that ray, and they all develop different powers for what reason, I don't know. In this one, you know, Ben, there's a bunch of rocks that fall into Ben's chamber. Fire gets into Johnny's. Reed stretches in his, I don't know. And then Sue is affected once the pods come back. Dr. Doom's transformation is also improved. He's not with them or he he is with them but like um he's not aboard the same ship like he is in the first one and somehow becomes evil by staying on the planet it makes sense that dr doom was stronger the the four of them get infected if you will vicariously through the planet whereas he is infused with the planet so clearly he's going to be the stronger one and he's actually scary even if he is a little goofy looking when he comes back, because he is stronger, you know that separately they're not going to be able to defeat him. So it creates this dramatic tension, which is what stories are all about. And it gives them cause to join together, even though they're clearly at odds with each other. There's this being that's now stronger than them, 
they need to band together to defeat him, use their brains to defeat him. I didn't understand his motivation in the first two. I 100% get it in this. He's no longer Victor Von Doom. He is the planet. He's coming back to say, you had your warning, now I'm putting a stop to this. Which is their motivation for getting together. And at the end, just don't name yourselves if you're going to cut to black. That is the stupidest thing. They did it in Avengers, Age of Ultron, I believe it was. Just say your name or don't. Don't cut away. It's not clever anymore. And one final thought on this movie. The reaction to Trank was a little unfounded. When rumor, when these rumors popped up and the movie was released and it tanked and it got bad reviews and things like that, people attacked Trank for it. But let me tell you, how many times have you been fired or demoted or removed from a project at work or anything? That's hard to deal with. And then to be removed from a Star Wars project because of that, that's even more shitty. I get that he hasn't, that he's kind of uh, dialed himself back and hasn't been in the limelight uh, or on Twitter or anything like that. I would too. Like, I don't know if I would ever recover from that personally. And the hard and fast truth is Hollywood is a for-profit industry. Like I said before, this is a business. The studios are trying to make money. They're trying to turn out... Uh, a quality product sometimes it doesn't happen it's not done on purpose i'm sorry if you think that it's not no one sets out to make a bad movie it just happens and if you are dealt a certain hand you're gonna want to make it work the best you can with what you have so just think of how much that that's that must suck for him for josh trank uh, and he got beat down more than once so i think just show a little sympathy when you're talking to or talking about this movie and give it a second chance really it's not that bad the acting's okay again the, in any of these movies n none of them are going to win an oscar no matter what even if trank's version is better it's probably the, it's probably not gonna boost this anymore but it, it's it's a good movie it's it's definitely not the worst superhero movie out there trust me so anyway that's this week's episode I thank you for tuning in. Until next time, that's a wrap. Mr. Brown, let's move too close to Mr. Shit. Are you the police? No, I'm not. We're musicians. I work for Kaiser Soto. This is where you know who me. I work for Kaiser Soto. This is where you know who me. Here's the fucking money, shit! Yeah.